All right, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Frank and, uh, and Pam Bearfield Training Center. I'm Captain Keith Sescaliba, that's spelled K-E-I-T-H-C-Z-E-S-K-L-E-B-A, with the Hoover Police Department. Joining me at the podium today will be Hoover Mayor Frank Brocato, spelled B-R-O-C-A-T-O, and Hoover Police Chief Nick Derzis, spelled D-E-R-Z-I-S. You may also hear from Lieutenant Daniel Lowe, spelled L-O-W-E, of the Hoover Police Investigations Division. Mayor Brocato will make a brief opening statement, and then Chief Derzis will read a prepared statement. After Chief's statement is complete, there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions regarding this investigation. Keep in mind that this is still an ongoing investigation, so there may be some questions that we cannot answer. With that, I will turn it over to Mayor Bercato. Thank you and good afternoon for you all coming today. You know, six days ago, our community learned about the disappearance of Carly Russell, and it sent fear and pandemonium not just through our city, but uh, the entire state and the nation as well. The media quickly joined us to get the word out about Carly. Our community sprung into action, and they organized search parties, arranged prayer vigils, and they took other steps that I'm not even aware of to help in this situation. The Hoover Police Department quickly rallied multiple partner agencies, stopping at nothing to find Carly. I'd like to take this time to say thank you first to the Hoover Police Department, our partner agencies, our wonderful community, and to all those that aided in some way in connection with this situation. As the days have gone on and more information has been shared, we know ev everyone has questions. The Hoover Police Department is known for being very methodical and thorough with their investigations. For that reason, we did not feel comfortable speaking in detail publicly until now. It is important that we share this information now so that our community can be put at ease. So at this time, I'll turn the microphone over to Hoover Police Chief Nick Dursis. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank everyone for being here today. Besides me stands the team who played a significant role in this investigation. I want to thank our department, members of surrounding local law enforcement agencies, the FBI, Secret Service, United States Marshals, and ALEA for their assistance in this case. We said from the evening of July 13th, our focus would be the safe return of Carly Russell. That occurred on Saturday, July 15th, approximately 49 hours after she called 911 and disappeared. From that point, our focus has been to determine Carly's whereabouts during that time and what exactly took place. Let me say up front, this investigation is not over. We're still working this case, and we've worked in this case until we uncover every piece of evidence that helps us account for the 49 hours that Carly Russell was missing. However, through the public interest, and in some cases, public fear that this story has generated, we owe it to our citizens to tell them the facts that we have uncovered. So I will give you the facts that we know today. On July 13th, at approximately 8.20 p.m., Carly left work from a business at the summit. Surveillance video from her place of employment shows Carly concealed a dark-colored bathrobe, a roll of toilet paper, and other items belonging to the business prior to her departure. She ordered food from Tzatziki's at the Colonnade and traveled there. She then traveled to Target on 280, where she purchased some granola bars and Cheez-Its. From there, she remained in the parking lot at that shopping center until 9.21 p.m. when she drove to I-459. Carly communicated on her cell phone with individuals known to her while on her path of travel up to the point of calling 911 at 9.34 p.m. And at this time, we will play the 911 call in its entirety. Interstate 459, and there is a kid just walking by their 
Carly called a relative after speaking with the 911 operator. She went missing during that conversation sometime after 9.36 p.m. Traffic camera footage was obtained which depicted this portion of the incident, and that footage was analyzed as part of the investigation in conjunction with the 911 call and cell phone data to accurately determine the time frame. Carly's 911 call remains the only report of a child on the interstate, despite numerous vehicles passing through the area at that time. No one has called to report that a child is missing, and the Hoover Police Department did not locate any evidence of a small child walking down the interstate. Data from Carly's phone, including her Life360 app, shows that she traveled approximately 600 yards in her vehicle while she was on the phone with 911, stating that she was following a child. 600 yards, that is six football fields straight, 600 yards. The Hoover 911 Center received a second call from Carly's mother stating that a relative was on the phone with her when they heard Carly scream and then they had an open phone line. Hoover police officers arrived on the scene within five minutes of being dispatched and several other officers arrived shortly. They located Carly's wig and cell phone in the grass near the vehicle. Her purse was located in the front seat of her vehicle with her Apple uh, watch in the purse. The food she ordered for Tzatziki's was also in the car. The items she purchased from Target, as well as the items taken from her place of employment, were not in the vehicle, nor were they located anywhere around the scene. Hoover police deployed all available assets from the point in the search for Carter. Additional resources were called in to include our own drone unit, crime scene investigators, numerous detectives responded to the scene. Throughout the day Friday, Officers from surrounded local and federal agencies assisted Hoover Police in the search for Carly Russell. Officers returned to the scene on 459 to conduct a thorough line search for evidence. K-9 teams from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department responded to check for any sign of Carly, the child that she claimed to see, and anything else that could be considered evidence in this case. Those searches all turned up empty. Private citizens, including search parties organized by our family, friends, began looking 
everywhere that they could to find any trace. These searches took place throughout the day Friday and again on Saturday, yielding nothing. At 10.44 p.m. on July 15th, the Hoover 911 center receives a call from Carly's residence stating that she returned home on foot. In subsequent investigations, detectives obtained surveillance footage of Carly walking down the sidewalk alone prior to arrival at a residence. She was conscious, conscious and speaking with paramedics when she was transported to UAB. Detectives were able to obtain a brief statement from her prior to being treated and released. During the statement, she told detectives that while traveling down the interstate, she saw a baby walking down the side of the road and called 911. She stuttered when she got out of her vehicle to check on the child, a man came out of the trees and mumbled that he was checking on the baby. She claimed that the man then picked her up and she screamed. She stated he then made her go over a fence. She claims he then forced her into a car and the next thing she remembers is being in the trailer of an 18-wheeler. She stated that the male was with a female. However, she never saw the female, only hearing her voice. She also told detectives she could hear a baby crying. She told detectives the male had orange hair with a big bald spot on the back. She said she was able to escape the 18-wheeler and fled on foot, only to be captured again, and then was put in a car. She claimed she was then blindfolded, but was not tied up because the captor said they did not want to leave impressions on her wrists. She said that they took her into a house and made her get undressed. She believes they took pictures of her but she does not remember them having any physical or sexual contact. She stated the next day she woke up and was fed cheese crackers by the female. She said the woman also played with her hair but could not remember anything else. At some point, she was put back in a vehicle she claims was able to escape while it was in the West Hoover area. She told detectives she ran through lots of woods until she came out near her residence. During this interview, Detectives noted that Carly had a small injury to her lip, and she claimed that her head was hurting. She also had a tear on her shirt. Detectives also noted that she had $107 cash in her right sock. Out of respect for Carly and her family, detectives did not press for additional information in this interview and made plans to speak with her in detail after giving her time to rest. Detectives continue analyzing data from Carly's cell phone that was left behind at the scene. We enlisted the help of the United States Secret Service in conducting this analysis. Part of what data includes several internet searches in the days leading up to their disappearance that I think are rele very relevant to this case. On July 11th at 7.30 a.m., the term, do you have to pay for an Amber Alert was searched. On July 13th, at 1.03 a.m., the day of her disappearance, the term, how to take money from a register without being caught, was searched. On July 13th, at 2.13 a.m., the day of her disappearance, the term, Birmingham bus station, was searched. On July 13th, 2.35 a.m., a search for a one-way bus ticket from Birmingham to Nashville was conducted with a departure date of July 13th. On July 13th at 1210 p.m., a search for the movie Taken, a film about a production, was conducted. There were two searches later to Amber Alerts on a computer at Carly's place of employment, including one regarding the maximum age of an Amber Alert. There were other searches on Carly's phone that appeared to shed some light on her mindset, but out of respect for her privacy, we will not be releasing the content of those searches at this time. We've asked to interview Carly a second time, but have not been granted that request. As you can see, there are many questions left to be answered, but only Carly can provide those answers. What we can say is that we've been unable to verify most of Carly's initial statement made to investigators, and we have no reason to believe that there is a threat to the public safety related, related to this particular case. Thank you very much. With that, we'll open the floor for some questions. Please raise your hand and I'll call them. Carol. Chief, do you expect any charges against Carly Russell in connection with <clears throat> the disappearance and in connection with what was taken from the Woods House Right now, our focus is to determine 
those 49 hours. So the investigation continues. So to be perfectly honest with you, that hasn't even uh, entered our mind or been discussed. One more question. Is it surprising to me that the family has not been cooperative in returning to be questioned? Well, I think the, fam the family has stated to us that they didn't think that, uh, that uh, in her mental state right now because of, uh, of trauma uh, of, of the incident, that she's not ready to talk is what we've been told. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, uh, question for Chief. Uh, you stated that the abductor had orange hair. Was this abductor black male? Was it a female, black female, white female? I believe it's a white male. Am I correct by saying that? <laughs> Was it ever? Yes, yeah, white male. Right. Is this uh, alleged abductor yet on the loose in the Hoover area? Don't believe so. We have uh, no report of that. Is any indication of mental illness in this case? Not that I'm aware of. There, there's been a concern in the community that if this were turned out not to be a, a true story, that the next time a young woman of color file was, was missing, that it might not be taken seriously. How would you respond to that? I'd respond to say that uh, we investigate every crime to the fullest, just like we have this one. Was she traveling with anyone specifically? <coughs> Excuse me, was she traveling with anyone since the time she disappeared, to your knowledge? No, not to my knowledge. Chief, I know you said you weren't able to verify a lot of aspects of the story. Where do you think she went, and how would you characterize what happened here? You know, that's, that's, uh, that's the $100 question. Uh, you know, we, we pretty much know exactly what took place from the time she left work until she got on the 911 call, and we can see getting out of, that, getting out of the car on the interstate from, from that footage, and after that, I think she only knows. We don't know. Well, one quick follow-up. Her parents. Did you speak with Carla's parents? And why do you think it is they were so adamant that there was an abductor? Yeah. I, I think uh, parents are believing what their daughter's saying. And we, we've had a very good rapport with the parents. Met with them on several occasions. I've talked to them uh, today a few times. And to make them understand that we're under pressure from our community, not only in our community of the state, but nationally when the story hit. And I just wanted them to understand that uh, today we were going to have a press conference and what we were going to detail today are facts. And everything that I've told you today is actual facts. It's not innuendos. It's not what I think. It's not what these detectives think. It is the factual information that we have. Chief, talking about the WPRC, how much time do you think they'll give the family before going back to Carla's <laughs> Well, I think our detectives have talked to the parents, and uh, we're ready, uh, we're ready to, to talk as soon as she's ready. So, you know, she called right now. We're ready. Uh, how about unknown? Uh, you know, we, we know the facts that we have. Everything else is unknown at this time. In the back. What, what have the past few days been like for you, your department? Uh, it, this has been a stressful search, hasn't it? Well, a absolutely. And, and again, the focus of the investigation uh, that Thursday when she went missing, of course, the focus was to get Carly home. That's what we want all. We wanted her safe and, safe and sound. And that's all happened. And then, of course, this, is, uh, this has gotten to be not only a local state story, but a, but a national story. So, uh, you know, it is. It, it's, uh, it's a lot of stress on, on everyone in, in the Hoover Police Department, in the, the, the mayor, uh, to, to every, uh, every citizen here. Uh, we want to know the truth. As you stand here, are you frustrated? I wouldn't say I'm frustrated. I mean, I'm very happy that, that Carly's home. That's the, that was the main ingredient here. And then we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. I promise you that. We'll, we'll end up figuring it out. Any idea about the number of manpower hours or the expense of the drones and, and all the rest of the search that that might have cost the city and the state and the federal government? Yeah, I, I, we haven't had time to, to, to consider that. But it's, a, you know, again, these detectives that are, that are here, this is just a small, a small group of people that have been, uh, been associated with this case. We have put every available resource that we have on this case because we wanted to make sure that we found out everything. We wanted to get her home, and we have. Chief, was there any prior indication not that, not that I'm aware of. Can you just expand on the uh, people from the state, the federal resources brought in, what were they doing exactly as you all were searching for him? Can you just expand on that? Sure, sure. Uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, from the, from the FBI side, uh, several, several agents helping us interview. I mean, as you well know, in a case like this, especially when it goes uh, national, we, we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls. And when you get those calls, some of them may just be outlandish, but you've got, to, you've got to follow up on them because you never know that you may get that one tidbit. 
And uh, I'd also say, too, that we had a great cooperation with the family. The family received hundreds and hundreds of tips, and every time they got a tip, they sent it to us. Would you say a crime has been committed? No. I will have, we have not determined that, no. Chief Mann, WAGG 610 Summit Media. Question for Chief. Uh, with all of the searches that you mentioned, Chief, that were on Carly's phone, does that kind of give you an indication of her mind state during this ordeal, the 48 hours? Yeah. That she went missing? Well, you know, again, I, we want to talk in facts, and, and I, I do think it's it's highly highly unusual to uh, uh, the day that, uh, that that someone gets kidnapped that uh, several seven hours or eight hours before that that they're uh, searching the internet, googling uh, the movie Taken about an abduction. I, I find that very uh, very strange. Yes. No, we do not know. Absolutely not. Chief, can you explain for us, you mentioned that a while ago you said that Carly was on the phone with 911. She was traveling six football fields, which tells you what? Which tells me that uh, I've had kids, and I'm sure a lot of people here have, and it's very, very, again, she said it, and I'm not saying it couldn't happen because I've always been one of these guys, never say never, but six football fields. I, mean, I, I, like, ath I like athletics, I like football. Six football fields. To think that a toddler, barefoot, that could be three or four years old, is going to travel six football fields without getting in the roadway, without crying, without any any just moving down, it's very it's just very hard for me to understand. Chief, have you used any technology to enhance that video from 459? And did you see a man grab her? We did not see. From what we can tell, we don't see anybody on the interstate other than uh, her car and then someone getting out of her uh, driver's side. We have sent that uh, that off to the uh, FBI for enhancement. It has not been returned. Do you think in this case that charges will be forthcoming towards Carly Russell? And how serious of a crime is it to not only fabricate a 911 call, but to lie to law enforcement during an investigation? Well, you know, again, that's not something that we've been discussing since we're going through the, uh, through the uh, uh, civil investigation. But, you know, people have to understand that uh, when, when someone says something like, the, like this, we put every available resource. Everybody comes together from, like I say, state, local, federal. It, it, it's, it's just a lot of work. And, uh, and, and, and you know, it, it, the man, man, gentleman early said frustrated. I mean, it is a little frustrating to think that uh, all this has been done and, and we can't find, uh, find anything out. Did anyone see her calling in from the side of the road when she made that 911 call? No, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Right, so is, this, is this investigation held up until you can speak once again Carly Russell? Well, there's a few things that we're still doing, but uh, obviously we want to talk to Carly as soon as we can uh, and, and do an in-depth interview. And at that time, uh, I think we'll have these investigators doing some other things. So uh, that's, that's all the questions the we're going to answer today. We appreciate you guys coming, and we'll be following up with y'all later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.